be in the March is uh, he's not uh, going to be here. Uh, and also on Bob, I'm not sure because I hadn't heard from Bob. I don't know if you did or not, Doug, that he was going to uh, be there. He's coming right now. He's in the waiting room. Okay. There he is. Morning, Bob. Yeah, sorry I'm late. I had trouble getting in. I couldn't remember our uh, our um, password or our code. It's always something. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's going to attend today's meeting is here, uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone today. Uh, I wanted to bring you uh, the committee, make them aware that at the uh, last board meeting on uh, February 15th, the swimming pool uh, regulations were adopted uh, for the RRLD. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, hopefully uh, put, uh, not hopefully, what we're going to do now is have the uh, the manufactured home and lighting uh, codes be acted on by the town board to establish a public hearing for the month of April. So uh, hopefully we'll get those moved through also. What we're doing is we're working on items that, uh, you know, the development office or some committee has decided that they would like to be moving forward on some of these. I know we have a list of items, but uh, we came up with that list. Some of them weren't, uh, you know, if you will, considered priority items. And so uh, for today's meeting, we, as you saw by the agenda, we had three different items on and uh, we'll discuss them. And, and uh, Doug is the uh, new Eric. So uh, he's going to uh, take over and we're gonna talk about the Parks and Recreation Committee, uh, what they wanted to uh, see implemented before, if we could, before the uh, parks open this year. So I'll turn it over to you, Doug, and uh, you can uh, explain about the parks and the recs uh, recommendations. Gary, I'm happy to do that. I was just looking at my notes here. Did you want to touch on pavers before we do that? Well, we could uh, touch on pavers if you want. I, I was under the impression we talked the other day you were you okay. know, wanted to go in parks, but we it shouldn't take too long on pavers. Uh, I think our discussion was the last time meeting, and also in between, I've talked to a couple, three individuals uh, in regard to it. Instead of having pavers be a code on the books, like to see it be you know something that would be considered as it is now either by the uh, planning and or zoning committees to the or boards to decide you know if it's warranted because it's only uh, certain areas of the town and checking with the uh, development office there's only been three or four of these uh, you know put forward within the last uh, year or two and so instead of getting them because most of the places that are having them they're kind of unique for that place and so it'd be easier for uh the uh, boards that i mentioned uh, you know to be acting on so i'll open it up for discussion and yeah, where, did think... you, where did you get this feedback from gary uh, the development office because it becomes an issue at nearly every one of our zba meetings mm -hmm. and in addition to that the environmental conservation board has to review every one of these. And generally speaking, I don't think I've seen one where the Environmental Conservation Board has even recommended pavers as being, uh, uh, permeable pavers as being a substitute for uh, different situations. And I'm sure Bob can go and, and uh, chime in on this as well. He, he experiences it once a month as well. It's a hot item with the uh, with CBA. You're breaking up for me, Bob. I don't know about the others. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a hot item. It's uh it uh, I would agree with uh with John. Um I, I if you want the ZBA direction uh you know for uh, how to go. I don't think you really want us to in a sense legislate I, I think, uh, as I brought up last meeting, and I think I went full circle in this thing from the planning board's perspective, uh, we see a proposal, uh, an applicant put porous pavement on the plan as uh, his uh, way of uh, abating the uh, stormwater management uh, requirements or complying with. And uh, there was always the question is, as to what the detail 
of that porous pavement would be? Is it, is it functional? Does it work right? Is it the right application in that particular property? And just to say a porous pavement uh, is being proposed was something that uh, at least my perspective was, uh, okay, it's a pretty generic term. It doesn't really get into the detail. And I think what you and I were talking about during the week, Gary, was that uh, uh, rather than show it as a specification, a detail within our design manual or some other part of our regulations, that we, uh, given the conditions can vary as to its makeup, that uh, we should look to the applicant and his engineer as far as uh, what that porous pavement's gonna look like in terms of its uh, design and construction. And uh, I, I think that's, that's where I was coming from. Now, whether John and Bob uh, have more of a concern as far as the regulation, whether, how much credit porous pavement gets in reducing the lot area coverage, I mean, that's, that's another issue. And I, I, I think, we, more, again, we were, I was more concerned about what kind of detail would be involved in, uh, in proposing a porous pavement that an applicant just can't use the generic term porous pavement. And there has to be a little more detail and that be a requirement that the planning board make in terms of our review that a detail be shown in the plan as to what that pavement looks like. I'm, I'm all comfortable with that, Chuck, but I do think that there ought to be some uh, motivation that we provide to community, to the community and to individuals uh, to use a porous pavement in applications. I mean, uh, I'd rather see porous pavement than blacktop for many applications, but if there's no benefit for people to do that, they're going to take the easy way out. I'll take it a step further. Right now, in addition to por uh, permeable pavers, we consider gravel driveways as part of lot coverage, mm -hmm. which to me is absurd. I don't, I don't understand that at all. That's a natural product. It's part of the earth. And why we would consider that a structure is beyond my comprehension. Well, it seems so that on this, I'm not trying to kick the can down the road. I know Chris couldn't make it today. I was hoping he would because we were going to be talking about uh, that uh, and pavers. Uh, but at the uh, April meeting, I would hope that he could attend so he could uh, voice his thoughts on it also, if you don't mind, John. I don't mind. I mean, but, uh, you know, I think it's what the community wants uh, to see as a long term solution as opposed to uh, the development office. But uh, I don't mind waiting another month. We've waited years since I've been on this committee to uh, address this. So another month isn't going to hurt us. So, okay. Gary, so I guess, I, go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say, you know, the, the Environmental Conservation Board that was brought up and I've been temporarily chairing those meetings. I think generally it's, it's not something that they like to encourage. Um, so, and I know that they would very much like to meet with the Ordinance Committee. Maybe that's something that could be done at a later time where you can meet with the Environmental Conservation Board where they can talk about that and kind of explain their, their rationale and their thought process too. That sounds like a reasonable suggestion to me. Right. So it sounds like the issue is yeah. not, not the detail of the design as to what a force pavement is, but it's more what kind of credit or um, prior, not a, a credit is the right word, I guess, that they would get on their lot coverage uh, as a result of using porous pavement. And that, that's, I guess, something we've, we've got to, that's sort of where we're going, guess, Gary, in terms of uh, this issue. Right. Well, isn't, yeah, it, I, isn't I, it both though, really? That, I mean, the design should be something that's uh, um, given weight, not, not just what kind of credit you get for, you know, substituting porous pavers for asphalt or concrete mm -hmm. or, I mean, both are important. Yeah, and I, I think with the design aspects, rather than getting into a specific detail, as I said before, uh, in our code as to what a porous pavement looks like, I think we, we let, leave that up to the discretion of the engineer for the applicant because the, the, uh, the technology of porous pavements and permeable pavers keeps changing every day. There's so many different options that uh, if someone wants to propose a, uh, something new, new and improved uh, over something we've seen before, uh, we should certainly consider it. And obviously with the input of our engineer, uh, agree to whether we're gonna use that. And then 
make sure that that detail uh, is spelled out in the uh, in the plans that are being uh, being approved. Yeah, and as long as that's included someplace so that they are aware that they have to provide that detail and that information for you to consider. You put that in design build standards or someplace just so that it is noted that it is a requirement. So I guess the issue going forward, Gary, is uh, do you get some sort of credit on your lot coverage for using some sort of porous or permanent pavement? Right. I, you know, that I uh, would agree with that, uh, you know, probably that's something you're talking about too, right, John? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I, I, I would just add for those, you people have been uh, around the block uh, and know how the variances go. On the, in the uh, lake area, um, we're, all, we're talking about pre-existing non-conformities. People want to uh, expand what they have in, in one of these, uh, given that label. And uh, part of the, uh, the trade-off is this porous paver currently. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's part of uh, what happens. Whether that's enough of an incentive, I'm not sure, but it's kind of like uh, the unwritten uh, way that CBA uh, proceeds. If people have scouted us out, they know that uh, that's what you do and that's what you mention. Now, uh, I must uh, uh, confess that I'm learning as I'm moving along and I'm only as good as the spiel that these, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 spokesman say, you know, and telling us what to do. Part of it's a leap of faith, because no matter what they, their uh, their their uh, grand design is, if this thing isn't maintained, then it really it's uh, it's not it really doesn't amount to much. So I, I'm I'm with what all of you have said, and uh, sometimes the devil is in the details. And that's where I'm uh, a little bit uh, uncertain as a ZBA member, uh, not understanding some of the details, but learning along the way. And I, I just, to add what you've just said there, Bob, I would go so far as to say that the ZBA has almost created precedent relative to permeable pavers as a solution to lot coverage issues. So is it agreeable to the committee that we uh, discuss this at the next meeting and hopefully get Chris there? Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get the environmental uh, board or spokespeople for them uh, to appear at that one. We'll, we'll probably give it a, should probably give it a try, right, Doug? I would agree, yes. Okay. I think it's something that they really want to weigh in. And I would also encourage you to uh, also include Kevin Albaney in those conversations because Kevin was very involved in... Uh, uh, with a number of you when we were doing the RLD uh, and the whole lot coverage when we introduced lot coverage. Um, and there was actually a, a focus group of uh, representatives uh, from all the municipalities around Canandaigua Lake that were part of that when we actually did that lot coverage uh, requirement. And the whole subject of pervious papers came up at that point. So I think he could provide a, a lot of information because you're really going back, you're talking about going back and revisiting that whole discussion that honestly took place for almost a year, so. Wow. <laughs> okay. So much for a quick discussion on papers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, now, now do we want, uh, Doug, do you want to uh, bring up about the, uh, the Parks and Recreations uh, Committee's? Uh, sure, How about, I'm gonna share my screen here so that we can, uh, Oh, look at uh, this this section. I emailed this out. Hopefully everybody uh, received this, but uh, we'll just kind of walk through this um, as we go. So the, this is the entirety of the town's parks and recreation section of town code. Um, it was last updated five years ago, uh, 2016. And uh, there's, there were a variety of things as I was working with the Parks and Rec Committee, there were a variety of things that kept coming up and it got to the point where it's like, okay, we just need to relook at that entire section of the town code and maybe uh, offer a, a complete um, rewrite of that entire section of code. So 
Um, if, if I guess what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through the entire section. Feel free to jump in and stop me at any point in time with any questions, and we'll just kind of go through and, and talk about the, uh, the section of the code. So this is a red line version, so you can see the changes. Can everybody see this okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Doug, we did not get the red line version, right? We just got no. the as is. Oh, I got the red line version. It should have been a red line. Really? Mine was I did. That was my question. Was was it the proposed amendment or was it the uh, current? Uh, and it looked like it was the current. But okay, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you're fine. You're fine. So um, the, no changes, obviously, until we get down here to duties and responsibilities. So keeping in mind, this is the duties and responsibilities of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Uh, in this particular section. So um, advise the town board on parkland and recreation needs. Um, we do not, we no longer have a position of director of parks and recreation. So it strikes that section out. And so it says advise the town of new parks or recreation facilities uh, and make recommendations for improvements or expansions relating to parks or reservations or recreations, I'm sorry. Um, they don't really get involved with the, the budgeting per se. I mean, we touch on it, but the, that's not really a, a uh, item that the Parks and Rec Committee really uh, does. Uh, prepare an annual report on Parks and Recreation Services to the town board. Um, you know, it's something they do a monthly report. So it seems a little redundant to do uh, a uh, annual report. So striking that out. Um, and then uh, prepare and submit to the town board from time to time proposed amendments to the adopted parks and recreation. So let me just pause as we go. Any questions on that first section? It's pretty just boilerplate stuff. So, okay. Um, this next section, section B, uh, it actually strikes this section because that talks about the director of parks and recreation, which we no longer have that position. So it strikes that section. Uh, the next section here, uh, just really some wordsmithing because <laughs> basically the town board appoints the parks and recreation members and um, you can see here as you as you kind of go that they're they're staggered terms so that most years someone is up and that it's uh, that there's a new person coming on or someone being reappointed um, it was it was unclear it it People were interpreting this section a, a few different ways in that the committee was able to appoint members if someone resigned instead of the town board appointing them. So this really kind of clears that up to say that vacancies on such committee shall be filled by the town board, period. So there's no question about it. All such vacancies shall be advertised in the town's official newspaper. Uh, the, the Parks and Rec Committee does have a youth member, uh, so there's no changes to that. Uh, automatically expires when the youth member reaches the age of 18 and the town board at its annual organization meeting shall appoint or appoints a, a chairperson for the committee. It did say a new member. Sometimes we're not appointing a new member. So it was just, uh, I think some wordsmithing that needed to be done there. Uh, any questions to that point? No? Okay. No. Next section here, uh, rules of procedure for the Parks and Rec Committee, section A. Um, again, striking the director of parks and recreation position that we no longer have in the set. So it would read, the committee shall meet at least once every quarter of the calendar year or when requested by two or more members of the parks and recreation committee. They meet monthly, but it does give that provision for the committee members to call a meeting. Uh, same as the town board, that follows state law, by the way. Um, Second here, the agenda shall be set by the Parks and Rec Commission. Our committee chairperson shall be made available to the public at least three days prior to the meeting. Again, following uh, state law in terms of uh, regulations for meeting advertisements. So um, I'll just pause there. Any questions on any of that section? Pretty, pretty standard stuff, really. Doug, <clears throat> Doug, could you send me a copy of this? Yes, I will do. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, park use regulations. Um, <clears throat> So the first section here actually striking this and, and parts of this code, there were sections that it's repeated in other sections and parts that it, it really kind of conflicted with other sections. So uh, the following regulations are hereby established to govern the use of park facilities and buildings. Uh, so uh, striking this 
this first section here, except for special events or program, because it was easier just to put it park hours of operation at town park shall be sunrise to sunset, except for special events or programming, or as uh, designated by the town board instead of a whole separate bullet point. Um, the consumption of alcoholic beverages, I'll touch more on this a little bit later. Currently, it's banned in all of our parks. This would say, unless authorized pursuant to chapter section 152.9. We'll go through that in a lot more detail in a minute. Uh, pets or domestic animals may be allowed at any uh, town owned or operated park where pets or domestic animals are allowed, they shall be, and it kind of goes through here, change here under the control of the owner in the designated joint city town dog park. So that's, that's obviously something that we do allow that's a joint project between the city and town. And then pets or domestic animals are not permitted on the lakeside portions of Onanda Park and Westlake Schoolhouse Park unless they are designated service animals. Um, let me just pause there. Any questions on that? Uh, do they have to be on a leash, the, uh, uh, the pet? Yeah, okay. so they have to be under the control of the owner. So it actually uh, says that uh, back up here. Um, under oh, the control by the owner. Oh, I see. Restrained by the means of a secure leash. Got it. Okay. Yep. Uh, the designated service animals comes up for us regularly at Onanda Park, where people come into the lakeside portion of the park uh, with pets. And um, there's probably not a day that goes by this past year, even with COVID, that my park rangers were addressing issues relative to pets on the lakeside portion of the park. Um, you know, I think that um, <clears throat> when, they, when they're designated service animals, um, a lot of times they'll have paperwork or they'll have a vest or something on, then it becomes pretty self-explanatory, but it, it does come up quite often. Um, any Question. other questions on? Sure, go ahead. Uh, on D, on that there, you uh, broke it down into uh, the two different parts, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Should we should we have it uh, maybe all lakeshore uh, portions of town parks, not knowing what's going to happen in the future? You know, I thought about that. And actually, as another section, keep in mind, I wrote this back in uh, September, but I thought about that also. <laughs> that uh, maybe uh, something to that extent, yes. I'm going to make a note of that. Okay. Um, any other questions on that one? Okay. Uh, fires permitted in, uh, so this changes the word grills to devices. We're actually trying to keep people from building bonfires in their grill in front of their cabin because it's destroying the grills and we're having to routinely replace the grills. Um, we're actually going to be uh, launching here before too terribly much longer. Uh, we had actually budgeted for and we've contracted to um, look at some improvements specifically for the upland of Onanda that may include some uh, designated devices for small uh, little fires, as well as we're looking at doing more of a community type of a fire ring down at the lake, uh, right at the lake for the lakeside, uh, instead of people building fairly large fires sometimes in their grills as a bonfire and it's, it's really destroying the grills. So that is a change there. Uh, jumping down here to section I, this adds the word vaping, smoking or vaping is not permitted in uh, any of the parks. Uh, Doug, just pause there for a second. Do you sure. get many complaints to people uh, complaining that others are smoking or anything like that down there? Uh, yes. So uh, we, we routinely, again, the park rangers this past year was our first year with park rangers. And um, in the past, what has happened is we had the lifeguards uh, at the beach, and obviously their, their main priority and focus is uh, they're responsible to protect the people, the swimmers. Uh, so this past year was the first year that we had the park rangers, and um, it was really, I think, the first year that we really enforced it more. And everybody, I think, was very, very polite uh, from what I heard. Um, there was only one issue that I heard of relative to someone smoking uh, at the lakeside portion of the park, that uh, it's specifically at Onanda. Uh, but otherwise, everybody was, it was uh, pretty cordial. I know the park rangers told me many different times where um, 
they would either see someone smoking or they wouldn't see it and someone would flag down one of the park rangers hey someone's smoking and it's really bothering me would you mind talking to the person and so they did so is there any thought been given to having designated smoking areas so uh the town board actually terry i, th I think it was pre-gary but i think it was probably right around 14 or 15 there was a whole I think a couple yeah. of meeting discussion and public hearings relative to smoking and uh, the town board at the time, they had talked about designated areas or, mm -hmm. or whatever the case, but they, I think the general consensus was uh, no smoking on any uh, facilities, any owned facilities. Um, and I believe the County, that was the same time the County, I think followed yeah. suit and did the same exact thing. Yeah, we did the same. We did it at any town owned property. I mean, it was unanimous. <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess it becomes more of an issue with the uh, cabins that if someone has a cabin for a night or two uh, after dinner, they go out on the the front yard and light up a cigarette and it's you know have a drink and uh, that that probably tends to happen more frequently than someone being down along the lakeside uh, swimming. But that certainly it's it's something that can happen. I'm sure it does happen. The other thing we've seen people go out to County Road 16, and that is something that, um, you know, at that point, they're not necessarily on the park uh, where they walk <clears> up <throat> the road and uh, light up a cigarette um, and then come back. So. Thank you. Yep, sure. Um, this next section, it, it did say campers, uh, but of course, recreational vehicle campers is what we're trying to just be a little bit more clear about that. Uh, trailers or motorized camping units are not permitted in any park. Um, <clears throat> we do allow camping, obviously, at Onanda with the cabins. <laughs> and uh, we'll touch base here in a second about tent camping. So uh, this, this clarifies that. Um, the Parks and Rec Committee did send me, or the chairman sent me a follow-up email here. Oops, that's not the one. Asking the question, uh, thought came up, I glanced at review. It says, no overnight parking of RVs at town parks. Would it pay to have a without prior permission from someone official added to that? I get what he's asking, but on the other hand, um, you know, one of the issues that we run into, especially with, with Onanda, is limited parking space. And a camper and trailers take up significant amount of parking. Um, so it just seems a little cleaner, honestly, I think, in the past. What we've kind of talked about is just leaving it out. Um, it, you know, saying no RVs, basically. Um, trailers or motorized camping units uh, permitted in any town parks. Does anybody have any comments or thoughts on that? No, it's good policy. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. The next section here, tent camping or cabin camping may be allowed um, in designated locations by reservation. So it, it previously said at any town park with written permission of the director of Parks and Rec, which we, we don't have a director of Parks and Rec. So a <clears throat> um, couple of thought things here, and this is kind of also trying to think ahead. We have a, a new rec reservation system um, we obviously allow camping overnights in our cabins. Uh, so if you have a cabin, you can certainly camp there. Um, sometimes people will put a little tent associated with their cabin rental right there uh, with their cabin. Um, so that's, that's all part of the reservation. Um, we're also going to be having additional conversation about tent camping on the uplands at Onanda as we move forward. That has come up a couple of different times. There's plenty of space to allow that to provide an additional service to the residents of the community. Um, so again, uh, if we did do that, uh, there would it would have to be part of a reservation system, obviously uh, of our new reservation system. So uh, to allow that as part of that. Any thoughts on? What, is, uh, what is cabin camping other than it, being in a cabin? Yeah, you know, so we have, uh, so obviously the cabins, you've got the, the smaller cabins that traditionally are a, a single family traditionally. And then we have Gorham Lodge, uh, which, which will uh, have overnight, it will sleep, 
uh, 55, I believe. And so uh, routinely we'll have larger groups like the Boy Scouts or mm. someone uh, come in for an overnight camping excursion or a trip or those types of things that Gorham Lodge. Uh, so that's that's kind of the reference cabin camping. Um, okay. This next section here uh, that has changes, boat launching at Onanda Park uh, by motorized vehicle vessels is prohibited between April 15th and November 15th. <laughs> the language that was that was here um, references an agreement that's in place between the DEC and the town of Canandaigua. It's a 99 year lease agreement that was in place that is obviously now being updated because DEC is in the process of turning Onanda over to the town of Canandaigua. Um, and so it just, instead of spelling out all the nuances with the winter boat operations, it says, okay, you can launch a motorized vessel um, basically other than between April 15th and November 15th from Onanda Park. With the thought obviously being there between April 15th and November 15th, that tends to be the busiest of the season for people camping, uh, people using the park for other purposes. Uh, launching of non-motorized vehicle top, uh, kayaks, paddle boards, windsurfing, uh, and recreational sculling vehicles is permitted outside of the swim area, except when conditions uh, exist in which the operator is unable to operate safely operate the vessel or when staff is directed no launching due to safety concerns. So um, this this concept of windsurfing and paddle boards and, and sculling vessels, it comes up quite frequently whether or not people can, can launch. Uh, we don't currently have anything in the code that will allow somebody to launch a windsurfing uh, device uh, at Onanda. Uh, so this adds that in. Uh, it does frequently. People do launch windsurfing devices there and are able to do it safely. Um, where obviously we can't have people in the swim area or close to the swim area, and that's where the uh, lifeguards have to make a judgment call there, uh, or staff has to make a judgment call when there's a concern that the person's not able to safely operate it and it gets closer to the swim area. So uh, this really kind of says, okay. We basically allow these non-motorized vessels, including the windsurfing, uh, for that area. So, yeah. Any thoughts, questions? No? OK. Um, launching of motorized fishing boats is permitted only uh, when access to the um, boat launch located at the north end is unavailable. So this goes back to um, this other section. And it also goes back to that, um, to the um, to the agreement between the DEC and the town. So, the the conversation that uh, we've had with staff and also with the um, with the Parks and Rec committee is okay. You can launch, and, and this really cleans the language up here. And you could make an argument these two could certainly be combined, but you can launch between April or um, you can launch other than April 15th to November 15th. You know, at some point, I, the, the conversation was the town board needs to make a decision whether or not they want to strike this section in its entirety or leave it in there. Uh, so currently, you cannot launch a motorized vessel at Ananda Park any time of the year unless the north end of the lake is frozen and the uh, state boat launch is frozen at the, um, at the state boat launch. Whether or not to leave it in there or not, um, you know, that is a question. So. What if the uh, boat launch at the north end of the lake is closed for some other reason than ice? Great question. Think, like, like during the summertime, um, I don't know if they had some catastrophic problem there. Yeah, and this would say that you could you could uh, launch a motorized craft from Onanda on the uh, 4th of July. We wouldn't be able to allow motorized vessels to launch anyway because of the swim area in the summertime at Onanda. It's too close. We just, it's too, it's not safe uh, for people to be able to launch motorized vessels when the swim area is operational. Well, maybe this should be taken out then. Yeah, I mean, because this says that 
if that boat launch is, is unavailable anytime. Well, it says here by motorized vessels is prohibited. Between well, just a, it's kind of contradictory though, isn't it? I mean, if well, that, if, does, which one overrides the other? I mean, it says when the north end of the lake is unavailable, it could be unavailable for some reason other than ice. Mm -hmm. So it just seems contradictory to me. That, so maybe strike P in its entirety? I would. I would. <laughs> I'm sorry, somebody said something I didn't hear. Doug, are there many people that are launching their vessels um, after November 15th and until April 15th? Do you know that? There, there are a fair number, you know, especially fishermen. Uh, fishermen will launch the smaller uh, vessels uh, during that time period, um, you know, to go out, whether it's duck hunting or fishing or, you know, even goose hunting. We've seen that. Um, that that tends to be the use during that time period and that's also a question that has come up is again do we want to go ahead and allow people to use that basically other than that time period april 15th to november 15th to launch a motorized vessel um and and completely strike p because if we let's hypothetically say we just strike p and take that section out about the frozen north end of the lake. Let's say we strike that in its entirety. So then people could launch anytime other than April 15th, November 15th. It, it does make it a little bit uh, cleaner in terms of, okay, well, I can launch my vessel other than that time period. Um, we have had requests in the past where people have wanted to pull um, boat hoist and those types of things out uh, because it was a lot closer uh, using Onanda. And up until now, we've always had to say no uh, because it's, you know, the north end of the lake wasn't frozen. So again, it's, I think it's something that the, you know, I don't know, there's pros and cons like anything else, right? And do you have any, um, well, you're not swimming in the lake, so I guess it makes it safe because people are not swimming. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, pull, mm. pulling boat hoist out is one thing, but I mean, allowing people to, uh, you know, go out and fish after November 15th uh, or before mm. April 15th or duck hunt, I mean, that's, I wouldn't see any problem with that. I mean, it's, I agree. It's just, just the wording here, I think, needs to be, I mean, if we want to allow that, we ought to say it that way that these are permitted uses, you know. And I'm comfortable with someone launching their boat from November 15th to April 15th, particularly if nobody's swimming there. Makes sense to me. It, Except it, for that whole... Yeah, it Except opens it up more. It opens it up so that people can use it more, obviously. Yeah. Perry, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Well, I was just going to say, except for that polar bear plunge. It might be swimming then, you know. Um, yeah, but that's not every year either. They've, <laughs> no, done that and they've moved that to Kershaw Park, I think, the last couple yeah. of years. So, yeah. No, I think we ought to just say what we mean, you know. Now, now Doug, they don't need any permit or anything like that to uh, do that, right? Not from the town, no. Uh, no. We don't currently uh, require anything at all like that. They no, need I mean, a they need a hunting license. We have had I'll, I'll share with you. We just recently yeah. had a situation where um, we had a boat full of duck hunters go out, and what what got our attention is the gate was closed because the north end of the lake was not frozen. So the gate was closed. the The vehicle pulling the boat went around our gate and actually, unfortunately, damaged the lawn up by the volleyball court. They they had to do a little bit of work there. And they went ahead and launched and um, Parks, you know, saw the situation there, uh, was waiting, ended up calling code enforcement because it's a violation of town code and then got the police involved and then come to find out that the people that, that did it um, 
didn't even have uh, the hunting license. They were duck hunting. They didn't even have a hunting license. So the DEC got involved. So, you know, those types of things do happen, but that's the exception. I mean, that that's honestly the exception. Everybody generally is pretty respectful, you know, I think so. Well, it just could be reworded to reflect that, that we would allow that kind of funding. Um, I, driving around the gate, I don't know if you have to have something in there that would also say when the park is open. Um, mm -hmm. Right. You know, some preconditions there that the. I, I have to ask one question here. Um, and I don't mean to confuse things, but it says motorized fishing boats. And is there a limit on the size? Would we better be better off defining it by size rather than by the type of boat? Because yeah, someone so, could so come John, up with a, your point right here. We yeah. added the word just motorized vessel. Okay, so and it, we're okay then if we just strike P because we got motorized vessel. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that's that would make it cleaner if we just strike P, honestly. I agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll move on here. Launching of non-motorized uh, vessels shall be permitted only within the designated portion of the shoreline or Nanda Park located between the boat ramp and the fishing dock. Um, <clears throat> you know, Gary, to your point, this is another one where, you know, I think we could make an argument that we should look at that, you know, because it's also come up during our recent conversations, could we relay out Butler Road Schoolhouse so that, for instance, um, I don't know if it's safe or if it's possible to relay it out, but so that you could launch maybe a kayak or something uh, from Butler Road, as opposed to just prohibiting it altogether, uh, which is what's been done in the past. So, uh, maybe this needs to say launching of non-motorized vessels shall be permitted. Um, I don't know. But anyway, it need, probably needs a little bit of wordsmith there. But as of right now, we only allow it at Ananda. So. Would it butler big enough to do that? That's a that's a different question, right? That's, that's exactly yeah. it. Not all that big to begin with. Right. Right. And then we've already defined non-motorized up atop, so we don't have to keep repeating it. So that's that's kind of what's going on there. Um, no motorized boats or non-motorized boats or inflatable sit-on devices or sit-in devices um, shall be allowed in the delineated swim area. We don't allow tubes and that sort of thing. And that's actually um, Department of Health rules and regulations. Um, Sorry, just making a note. So that the lifeguards are able to see, you know, uh, if you get somebody in there with a big inner tube, a uh, kid may be on the other side that they can't see that may be struggling. So, um, okay. Uh, no organized multi boat event, kayaking, paddle boards, or other recreational sculling vehicles without permission from the town board. Somebody wants to organize something, they can always basically come to the town board and get permission. Otherwise, they're not allowed to do some big multi-event. Um, okay, section V here. The non-trailered unloading, loading, or launching of non-motorized vessels shall be permitted through the Onanda Park Gatehouse. Non-trailered specifically word was added. We've been having an issue with trailers uh, coming into Onanda Park with um, basically anything and everything, uh, <laughs> kayaks, uh, you name it, whatever, paddle boards, whatever. Um, and the problem is we don't have the room to, to basically hold a bunch of trailers uh, there for those types of, um, for people to launch. So there's, there's space there. They can go in the uplands. They can pull down, drop the stuff off at the gatehouse. Uh, go back out and around, but we can't have basically the trailers parking on the lakeside, especially on a busy weekend uh, where they're taking up as many as, you know, last year we had a situation where we had three or four trailers at the same time. And then we had people that um, 
you know, needed to get access for one reason or another, and it created a situation there. So anyway. To that point, Doug, why don't you say something about trailers needing to be parked in the Uplands parking lots? Yeah. I don't remember. I'm going to make a note of that, John. I don't know if that's in here somewhere already, but yes. I did not see that as I read through yeah. it. Okay. But it could be. Okay, sure. Absolutely. Uh, w here, all equipment for boats. Um, including non-motorized vessels. We've already defined it up above. We don't have to keep defining it. So it was defined three times in that one section. So. Um, non-motorized vessels, again, we've already defined what it is. So we don't have to keep defining it. Um, the fee for launching non-motorized vessels, again, we already defined it. We don't have to keep doing that. Shall be included in the daily entrance fee or season pass. Um, and then striking the rest of that um, section. That, and, and we discussed that a little bit. We, I don't know why there was a limitation on two non-motorized canoes or kayaks, but you get a three person family renting the cabin, it's entirely possible all three of them have a kayak, but we'd only allow two of them to have a kayak. It just seems silly, so. Yeah. Um, Persons not renting cabins that are not a park shall leave their non-motorized vessels. We already defined it. Uh, non-motorized, here, I'm going to skip these because we've already defined that. So, all right. Um, okay. This, um, I don't know why this was still in here, but we, <laughs> as part of the uh, Canandaigua Lake uh, water trail that we're trying to promote, um, people can come into, for instance, um, Onanda Park uh, from the lake using their kayak. This section says you can't come into Westlake Schoolhouse from the waters of Canandaigua Lake. Um, you know, so we either need to, this one is a, again another discussion point where we either need to strike it in its entirety or we need to say, uh, unless by emergency purpose, because we have had multiple situations where people uh, in an emergency situation need to come into Westlake Schoolhouse. Uh, we've had some where it's been a, a very bad emergency situation. We've also had situations where, you know, the water's getting very rough. And at that point, when the water's getting rough and somebody's in a kayak, they need to come in. Um, the lifeguards may have already pulled people out anyway. They're going to help whoever get in. And then the person is going to call somebody to come pick them up from a car. And then they, you know, so it's, it just striking. It gives a little bit more flexibility um, for whatever the conditions are. Instead I support of us, striking it. Yeah. Yeah, that's reasonable. <clears throat> All right, HH, uh, the lifeguard on duty has the authority to enforce the rules. We have had, believe it or not, a situation where a lifeguard who was not on duty trying to argue with a lifeguard who was on duty about what should be done. So anyway. That's an administrative issue, Doug. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, all right, uh, licensed fishermen may shoreline in or stream fish. Previously, it said at Onanda Park. Meanwhile, we have Sucker Brook in, a, in Outhouse. We have other places. We have Miller Park, or not Miller. We have uh, Blue Heron Park. We have uh, the ponds at Outhouse where people could absolutely fish. So this just strikes Onanda, and, and basically, this since this pertains to the entire section of uh, Parks and Rec. Um, this strikes out also the fishing because we've just addressed it up above at Westlake Schoolhouse. Again, um, we can't, you know, again, it depends on how the layout is. I think that there is room there to look at Butler Road Schoolhouse um, and give us a little bit more flexibility in, in how that's done. If a section of that, you know, whether or not we have kayaks or whether or not we have fishing, um, if somebody's endangering somebody who's swimming, obviously a lifeguard is gonna stop that anyway. So. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bum. Okay. This next section, pedaling, selling, hawking, uh, no pedaling without prior authorization. It currently says by town board, uh, we have a pedaling 
selling hawking permit that is required by the town of Canandaigua. So um, if they go through that process, this would open it so that they could get that permit and, and do that. But obviously there's a variety of rules that they have to follow and stuff they have to follow. Um, pavilions and ball fields must be reserved in advance, just strikes the rest of that. Uh, all of this stuff really relates to the director of parks and rec, so it strikes all that since we don't have that position. Jumping down here, uh, the town board reserves the right to require liability insurance in the amount determined by the town board for group, uh, organized groups or events using park facilities. It may vary depending on the activity and what's going on working with our insurance company. So uh, provides that uh, provision in there. Uh, Can we pause there for a second, please, sure. Doug? Yep, yep. So does that mean now that any group that wants to rent the facility has to go before the town board to determine how much liability insurance they're to provide? No, they set, they, it's basically a set, they set by resolution. It's a, for a larger organized event like that, it's like a $2 million policy that's required. Uh, when you're talking about large events, those sorts of things. If well, that's already a, scheduled somewhere. Yeah. Okay. If it's, um, um, if it's like a activity, like somebody, you know, we have had quite a few weddings at Onanda Park. That's a different, that doesn't fall under that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Uh, let's see here. This adds uh, schoolhouse park if you're coming in. Um, again, provides a little bit of flexibility there uh, in terms of what the future may look like for a schoolhouse park. Um, I have to ask to pause again there also. Sure. Yeah. So they have to have a permit to be able to pull into schoolhouse or, or Onanda Park? So it's um, not a permit, but the payment. So the town board has adopted a fee schedule, which includes a payment requirement into um, Onanda Park if you're coming in by water. Um, so if a person lived in close proximity and they were canoeing, in theory, they could not pull into either one of these parks then. Um, in theory is exactly how I would say it, John, because because <laughs> here's what it says. So it says, unless receipt of a proper pre payment is presented to town park staff upon request. Yes. So if they're not requested, who's going to say anything, right? Right. Okay. And, and let me tell you why it was put in there, because we require people coming in by uh, land to, to pay, pay a dollar. Yeah. Right. And so as to not make it different, it was put in there. Yeah. That, that was the thought process at the time when it was done so okay. that it was the same for everybody, but. Who's going to question it, right? Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yep, yep. Unless you get one uh, on duty lifeguard arguing with the on duty lifeguard about <laughs> whether they should. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, all right. Public had, to light, had to lighten up the uh, conversation. Yeah, I know. It's pretty dry material. So, <laughs> did you have something, Terry? Did... No. Oh, okay. Right. I agree. All right. Uh, public conduct at parks. I'm going to skip down here. Um, set fire, uh, except for in an approved device that we talked about earlier. Um, bring in, leave behind, or dump any material in any kind. Um, strikes out refuse is not to be dropped, thrown, or scattered on park property. All recyclable materials should be carried out by those persons bringing them into the park. Why are we striking it out? Well, yes, we do carry in, carry out, but we also provide doggy waste containers for dogs. We also provide recycling containers at Onanda, and we also provide trash bins at Onanda. So Generally, because this is general to all parks, we try to encourage everybody to carry in, carry out. But there are devices in all of the parks now. Um, so skipping down here. The other thing that we added under public conduct, and this was actually as I was reviewing other parks and rec code 
Uh, this would be a new section, be under the influence of a substance to the point of being a danger to themselves and or other park users uh, that may include um, alcohol, obviously, because uh, this next section we're going to talk about alcohol or uh, some other substance. Uh, and we have had that also where a group of kids decide they're going to get together and choose Onanda Park to be a good place to uh, smoke pot or whatever the case. So this would allow us to uh, have something to go back and enforce. Um, okay. Facility alcohol beverage permit. This is a new section in its entirety. And the intent of this, let me say that, is to allow individuals who are renting a facility for an event to be able to consume alcohol on the premise, which is currently otherwise prohibited. Um, and this does not pertain to someone renting a cabin who wants to down a six pack of beer for the night. They actually would not be able to do that because they would never be able to get the facility alcohol beverage permit. So, um, we'll Dr. Just, Luke, yes, go ahead. Before we start going into each one of these bullet points, can we just talk about the concept itself? Sure. Because in my opinion, if a family is going into the park and they're having a picnic and they want to have a beer to cool off on a hot summer day or the wife wants to have a glass of wine with her lunch why are we regulating that it seems to me that what we want to regulate is the people that are using alcohol abusively and i think bullet k of the previous paragraph that we just discussed addresses that so the short answer, John, and, and I personally, I agree with you. I think it would be nice to go down to Ananda, sit by the water and have a glass of wine. Or if I was renting a cabin, to sit on the deck and have a glass of wine. I 100% agree with you. However, here's why it's not really practical for us. Our insurance carrier. <laughs> Truthfully, that's what it comes down to. The insurance so, carrier says. Talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so the insurance carrier says it exposes us to increased liability um, and that uh, they do not recommend it. They are fully on board, and I've gone through this with our insurance carrier, they're fully on board with a uh, facility alcohol beverage permit the way we've described it. But in terms of the person who, um, to prevent liability on the part of the town, the person, like I just explained, sitting on the deck of the cabin having a glass of wine that may become intoxicated and either hurt themselves or someone else, that puts the town in a greater liability uh, situation. So I, let me I, ask this question then as a follow-up. Can the rules be stated without having someone obtain a permit to do it? So, so I mean, you've just outlined a bunch of clauses here, A through M, that if we initiated all these clauses without the person having to obtain a permit, is that going to satisfy the insurance company? So they would not be able to have alcohol in any of the parks unless they had the, the alcohol beverage permit. That's my point. So I'm saying to you, just one second, I just want to close this door. Sure. Um, so you say in here, like the person can't distribute alcohol and um, that they gotta be over 21. Couldn't we put these bullets in and then not require the person going into the park that wants to enjoy that beer by the lake or that uh, glass of wine by the lake? Would that um, alleviate the concern of the insurance company? No, because what they're saying to me is that it protects the town if we're requiring this permit, that this is a organization that's associated with an event, they've rented a facility, they are taking on the liability for serving basically the alcohol to the event attendees they're taking on that responsibility by getting that permit. And so then that alleviates, it's never going to fully alleviate, 
but that limits the exposure of the town because the town has outlined a process where if you're going to serve alcohol, here's how you do it. Do we have a facility alcohol beverage permit currently? So this would create it, Terry. This okay. Would, this would actually create it. Yeah. My, and you know, my they, issue, my bigger concern than alcohol abuse would be underage drinking, but I think that's covered uh, in G. But um, I, I see that as a as a uh, a big issue. You don't want high school kids saying, "Hey, uh, you know, we're going to uh, party it up." on uh, on town uh, at a town park you definitely well, don't want that they would have to come in and apply for a permit and obviously provide all of the information and they right. wouldn't be able to get that permit if they're not right one good so, yeah so it would be an additional permit for sure it would be an additional step yes. um that, that that would have to be done they would have to provide uh all the necessary requirements associated with this um obviously the point person, all that stuff associated with the permit. This is really designed more for things like, um, i give you an example. We had talked to the Chamber of Commerce about the chamber doing a dinner at Gorham Lodge. Gorham Lodge will hold 150 people, no problem at all. But they haven't been able to do it up until this point because can't serve alcohol. This is really designed more for like an entity uh, that is renting a facility and then doing it or Crouch Hall at Onanda, or Honest and Truly for that matter, we've got the lodge at Outhouse Park. Uh, it, it would be really to use our facilities for other things that up until this point have not been able to be used for. Do we have uh, any uh, knowledge of or anyone ever reports seeing people sitting on the deck of one of the upland cabins having a beer? Oh, all the time. That's I I got to believe that that happens. Oh, yeah. We, Without and we, a doubt. And we kind of close our eyes to it. So, well, we are park rangers. This past year, that was our first year for park rangers. I can tell you that uh, um, it was regularly that park rangers were telling me that they were asking people to uh, not uh, participate in their alcoholic beverages uh, on the lakeside. Uh, we've had issues on the uplands where there are groups of underage, you're absolutely right, uh, that have uh, been partaking in alcoholic beverages, and we've gotten the authorities involved. Uh, we also have the overlooks of the waterfalls up farther where we routinely find beer cans and all kinds of different things where people have gone up there and they're doing a variety of things. So um, it absolutely happens without a doubt. Yeah. It absolutely happens. So. No, it's very difficult for uh, somebody to, you know, enforce, you know, that somebody said, I agree. I mean, someone's sitting on the deck there having a beer or a glass of wine or whatever. I mean, I have no, <laughs> um, no problem with people doing that. However, when it comes to liability, I mean, this certainly seems to would absolve or mitigate our uh, um, exposure, you know, if something happened, you know, by, for, by having people have this, uh, permit. So I, I, I just, I use this, I put it in and I do it. I, Let's just, um, touch on these. So it, again, it has to be an organization, uh, and they have to have a facility. So they're, they're renting a facility. They couldn't just get the permit without a facility. Um, intending to sell, distribute, blah, blah, blah. They have to have a, a permit from the New York State Liquor Authority. Um, alcoholic beverages are not permitted in town parks without a facility permit and the rental of a, alcoholic beverages defined by this chapter, including alcohol, spirits, liquor, wine, beer, cider, every liquid or solid uh, patent or not containing alcohol, spirits, wine, beer, capable. By the way, this language, um, it, I had to modify it a little bit, but uh, this is standard boilerplate language for many many, many uh, different um, municipal parks have this same exact language, uh, including Monroe County, I believe for all of their parks have this same language. Uh, the state also uses very similar language for state parks. Um, facility alcoholic beverage permit will be set by the town board that the fee for the permit. Um, any organization making permit application obviously shall be sold, shall approve a liability insurance. 
Um, no person shall be under the age of 21, uh, can't consume, uh, can't become intoxicated. Um, person intoxicated while in a town park may be subject to eviction and or associated penalties. Uh, permitted principal contact or receipt of the, shall be in the town park. Uh, designated with the permit at all times while the beverages are being distributed, sold, and or consumed. So you can't have um, Harry Smith go get a permit and then him not be on the site that day. So we would we would definitely enforce that before the uh, open the facility up, make sure that they're going to be there. Um, and then non-observance shall constitute a violation. Non-observance of that section should constitute a violation. So um any other thoughts or comments on the whole thing and the uh, repercussions of a violation it's, are defined okay. it's down a little bit farther i okay. want to touch on that before we okay. yeah yeah any other thoughts okay um town parks shall be open and closed as provided by this chapter with a resolution of the town board uh registered guests at onanda um, are authorized, obviously, and staff to be overnight. Uh, technically, I think our, our guests that currently are in violation of our own town code by spending the night in the park, but that's a different story. Uh, so this cleans that up and fixes that. Uh, enforcement, town uh, and rec staff, we don't have the director of parks and rec, so it strikes that out. Um, Members of the New York State Police, the Sheriff's Department, obviously code enforcement, we left that in. I didn't know what to put in here, truthfully, in terms of this because um, recreation changes. So I just put town manager and or his designee that way as we have um, um, park rangers or we have other people that we can just designate that. Um, town parks and rec staff members, uh, members of law enforcement agency and those listed uh, have the authority to eject from any park uh, for violation. Penalties for offenses. This is the violation section. Uh, so the violation section, uh, any provision of this chapter shall constitute a violation, be a punishable of a fine not to exceed 350. Change this to 500 so that it matches our other sections. Our other violations are, it says a fine not to exceed 500 uh, for, for each violation per day or no restitution of damages imprisonment of not less than 15 days and or such fine imprisonment. It gives the judge a lot of flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. the, the fine uh, not to exceed $500 and or restitution of damages. We have had damages done at our parks and uh, I actually had the judges look at this for us and they were both great and provided some feedback and they liked the wording because they felt like currently they were limited to finding a maximum of $350 when somebody does, you know, maybe $2,000 worth of damage. But because of the code, the way it was currently written, it really limited them. So uh, this says $500 for each violation per day and or restitution of damages and or by imprisonment of not more than 15 days and or by both such fine and imprisonment. So it really gives them a lot more flexibility depending on the circumstances. So. All right, I know that was a lot, you guys. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Doug. No, it's needed. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, I think the version that we got that wasn't redlined was, you know, the version with all these changes in it. Yeah, all the red I'm lines just were looking it up. Yeah. Yeah, red lines were black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got received the red lines. Must be the internet uh, section for that doesn't move further south for Chuck and Terry. Yeah. It's our cheap devices. Life is tough on the frontier, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Now, how does the committee want to uh, move on this uh, after Doug makes the changes, uh, if they want to get this uh, on the books, if you will, before the season really starts for the parks, uh, we're running up against some, uh, you know, hard uh, deadlines because if we, uh, Doug makes the changes and gets it to us that are April 5th meeting, uh, and then we agree on everything uh, at that time. Then we send it out to the county, the zoning, the planning, the environmental, the attorney, uh, with the hope that we probably won't get it back until June before we could ask the town board to establish a public hearing, which wouldn't take a place until maybe July. Um, if I can make a suggestion, Gary. Sure. 
Uh, I would recommend we approve it uh, contingent on Doug's markups yeah. and uh, okay. just let Doug send us the markups here in the next few days. And we just say, okay, okay, looks good, whatever, and, uh, and move on with it. Okay, I that, think that's we've had adequate discussion. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's fine now because that was the other option that I had in that. So, thanks, John. Uh, yeah. So then we can uh, do that, and then uh, hopefully we could, uh, you know, get it out to the different parties that we need, so we can establish a public hearing for it in uh, May, hopefully uh, or June. The the good news is, Gary, this is uh, administrative. It's not land use, so it doesn't have yeah. to go to the county. Uh, so we can uh, okay. just go ahead and set the public hearing. So. Oh, good okay. news. Great. So we could we could set the public hearing at our March meeting then. Yes. Okay. Approve it in April, so it'd be in time for the uh, season. Really. Yes. Yes. Good. That's good. It's one of the few laws that doesn't have to go to uh, county planning because it's not land use planning. So. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, should we hold off, Doug, on bringing up the uh, anything else, the billboards? Yeah, we need to talk about the billboards, yeah. but if you want to hold that off and do that next month, I completely understand. It's already been an hour, so that I don't think that's an issue. So, Okay, well, I don't want to hold things up. That's why I was wondering about it. Is, is there anything else that uh, any committee member would like to bring to our attention before we adjourn? We want to vote on the parks. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, I'd like to uh, get a motion that uh, with the changes that Doug makes that uh, he sends out to us and to look at and uh, to uh, affirm what he has or make changes to what he has. Uh, I'll make a motion to that. Is there a second? second? Motion made and second. Any more? Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Gary, thanks. Gary, do you mind if I throw out another idea? Uh, <laughs> if it's this going to be? <laughs> no, I, I just uh, I was going to say if this uh, billboard issue is important enough, uh, I'm I'm open to meeting again. In, and sometime between now and our next meeting, if it's necessary. Okay. What do you think, Doug? Um, it, it would be, it would probably be helpful. And especially if, I guess, you know, let me, let me kind of go back to, you had a conversation earlier about meeting maybe jointly with the ECB. I know that they would really like that. There's some things that they would like to bring up to you. Whether you do that at the April meeting or whether you have another meeting, you've got you've got that issue, and then the billboard issue is also uh, we have uh, pending litigation relative to the billboard issue, so it is something that does need to be addressed. So. And the only reason I brought it up was because I did see that there was a litigation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the calendar here to get an idea. I know in the beginning we used to have a couple of meetings a month and then we held back after the pandemic hit, but uh, with the things that are coming on board now, it seems so that uh, probably be a good idea if we did have another one. Uh, is the uh, 17th or 18th of March, is that uh, acceptable? One of those days? What day, what day of the week are they? It's a Wednesday and a Thursday. Well, John and I are going to be busy on the 17th. Yeah, that's a national <laughs> holiday. <laughs> well, put it differently, Terry. We might be hung over and not be able to meet on <laughs> We'll be we'll be over at Onanda Park having a beer by the water. I'm just gonna say with you, Terry, you wouldn't be able to use Onanda Park because that's only allows uh, beer and wine. <laughs> that's enough. All uh, kidding aside, I'm good either one of those days. I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, what's the consensus of the committee? Uh, 17th on a Wednesday or Thursday? The 17th or 18th of March? Well, if you don't mind, I prefer Thursday, but that's okay either way. Thursday. How about you, Bob and Chuck? Uh, I can, I'm open either way. I'm good. The okay. only thing about the 18th, we have a finance committee meeting on the 18th oh. at 8 a.m. Oh, gosh. Yeah, um, seven. You have to be a seventeenth. Huh? Okay, seventeenth. 
Okay, and at that meeting, we'll talk about the billboards, uh, the environmental committee. I don't know. We give them enough time to uh, meet with us at that time, you think, Doug, or should we have them on uh, the April 5th meeting? But don't they normally meet like, what do they normally meet? Like six o'clock, is it? Or they, 4 they, 30 or? Right. They traditionally meet at 4 30 on the first Thursday of each month. So they have a meeting this coming Thursday. I'm happy to talk to them uh, about the 17th, if that's what you'd like. I just wonder if they'd be available. I don't know how many of them are, you know, uh, you know, working or. Yes, yeah, some of them may be and some of them may not be, to be quite honest yeah. with you. A couple of them are retired, I know. Uh, and then some of them I know uh, are not retired. So, uh, but yeah. So more than likely, it'd probably just be certain ones that would attend anyways, right, Doug? More than likely, I would think, yes. Well, let us know on that, and then we can uh, work it in. Okay. Is, is there anything else that anybody would like to bring up for this meeting? Not. I'd like to get a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Or any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, no. So our next meeting will be the 17th of uh, March and at uh, nine o'clock. Okay. Very good. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Um, Happy St. Patrick's Day, Terry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. <laughs> Up the Irish. Yeah. See you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Take care now. Thanks Bye. for attending. Bye now.